All right, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Nithin Ramachandra from, from the NR Hour Sports Show, back with another episode. Uh, happy Thursday. Uh, obviously, we're well into the new year now, and I hope everyone is having a great, healthy new year. And um, today's guest is a really special guest. Um, actually, we had the opportunity to cover them last season with our other media company. Um, he used to pitch with the trend. He's pitching. He pitched with the Trend Thunder um, out of the uh, MLB Draft League, and we got to cover them. And we got to and, and Hunter, man, uh, we got to see him pitch a couple of times. Um, you got you, you. He's an unbelievable talent. He come from Seton Hall University. He pitched over there, man. What a great career there and. Uh, Stephen Hall is a great program, obviously, with uh, not only baseball, but other sports, too. So um, he was in good hands there and then came to the LMB Draft League, um, obviously showed showcased his talent there. And now uh, we're, we're pleasure to have him on the show. And we are live on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, on all the podcast platforms. So fans, please tune in on our Spreaker app. Everybody knows that. But uh, well, without further any without any any further to do, uh, Hunter Weld- Waldis, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Nathan. It's it's a pleasure. I was excited about this, so I'm glad you know included me and uh, wanted to you know get to meet with me. So I appreciate that. Yeah, we actually we didn't get the opportunity to interview in person. Obviously, we interviewed some of your teammates in person last year. So um, now uh, looking forward to knowing more about your story. And uh, obviously, our fans are really interested in this too. So um, Hunter, when when who when did you get interested in playing baseball, and um, who would you say? Um, that you looked up to, like pitcher wise, growing up. Ooh, that's a tough one. I got a couple different answers there, so there's a little bit of history to it. So, I've always been uh, involved in baseball, a lot of sports when I was younger, but especially baseball. So, my dad actually played at Seton Hall. He was a graduate in 1989, so he played with Craig Biggio, Mo Vaughn, John Valentin, and those guys. So, he definitely got me interested in the sport, uh, and I would say I always looked up to him because he was a pitcher as well. Um, he, I don't know, there was something about growing up playing baseball with him. Like, I'm sure you've heard the term like helicopter parents. He was the opposite of that. Uh, you know, he always made baseball fun because you'd go to these tournaments, you know, as a 12, 13, you, you'd see, you know, some of your friends and their parents yelling at them. My dad was always like, hey, win, lose, or draw. Like, did you have fun? And he kind of, you know, exploited that out of me. And that's where I had the most fun. So I got the most interest because he let me, you know, do my own thing and just play and no matter what happened, I always got back in the car with him. You know, here's a Gatorade. How'd you like it? Whatever. So yeah, I'd always looked up to him. If you were to ask me professionally though, um, growing up, that's a tough one. I always loved Mariano Rivera's demeanor. Hmm. He's, he's the yeah. king for that reason. But uh, recently actually, um, which we can get into later, but uh, I work at Del Barton now and uh, R.A. Dickey came to speak. Oh. Uh, about two months ago and I got a chance to meet with him face to face and his story and everything that he kind of enlightened on us was really cool. And I took that to heart. So I've been kind of looking at him and, you know, about handling adversity and just plowing through when things don't go your way. And uh, yeah, so those two guys definitely highlight something in my mind. Yeah. So uh, we sent you the link so you can send to your, uh, your grandma if you want to. It's just oh, cool. Absolutely. Here is it on. Oh, perfect. Yeah. It's called Spreaker. Yeah. I got you. How do I? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate oh, that. No Jesus. problem. Yeah, so obviously you're from. I'm in your neck of the woods here right now in Florida. So what what was it like growing up in in Naples, Florida, your hometown? So believe it or not, actually, I grew up in New Jersey. Oh. Uh, I moved to Florida in 2019. Sorry, I don't just want to send this out. Uh, I originally grew up in New Jersey my whole life. I was from uh, Morristown area, Tewksbury. That kind of stuff. My family moved down to Naples in 2019 in the middle of my college career, and I just switched residencies there. Mm. I, I spent I spent as much off time as I can in the warm weather. But growing up in New Jersey was definitely a it's much different experience in Florida. Obviously, weather wise, you know, you got to find ways. You know, if you got to get your work and you got to go find indoor facilities, you got to you know kind of create a little bubble and a you know, hub of people you know and feed off that and get your work in that way. So, but. Yeah, I would definitely take uh, the Florida environment over New Jersey, especially when the winter time comes around. So, yeah. So, uh, can you tell your tell our fans about the delivery you guys you have? Uh, you have a long stride delivery in your repertoire, and obviously, it's to be seen in live in person when we cover you guys. But take us to that process. How did you come about that, and um, what what made that work for you throughout your career? And um, I I, I like to do comparisons, and you, you remind me kind of like Ray Davis a little bit, the way you uh pitch on the mound and speaking of uh 
demeanors. Obviously, Mariano too. But uh, to me, you look like a like a Ray da- Ray Davis type of uh, pitcher. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Another comp I had actually was Dennis Eckersley too. Okay. Uh, yeah. from the past. I mean, I've always been, you know, a tall, lengthy, gangly kind of kid, you know, long arms, long legs, that kind of stuff. Um, so believe it or not, I just, you know, growing up again, my dad wasn't a helicopter parent, super appreciative of that. So, you know, I kind of, when I got to the age around like, uh, 12, 13, I met a guy, his name is Joe Hamacher, and, uh, he's actually the current pitching coach at Princeton right now. Oh, wow. And, um, he ended up going out to work with Tom house and early to mid two thousands and kind of learned a lot. And he just kind of taught me a lot about, you know, how the body should move and, and ways in which we can throw that can be healthy and efficient while still maintaining strength and speed and all that stuff. So it's definitely been a long journey, but with, with that, there's a lot of moving parts. So it's funky, it's fast. Um, you know, you can, anybody can look up my stats. There's some command issues there, but there's also a lot of strikeouts. So right now my goal is trying to, you know, minimize where I can figure things that, you know, where it might work for me success wise and go from there. Well, yeah. So uh, we are live with Trent Thunder pitcher Hunter Wallace. Uh, we have, uh, we have a fan question for you already on my app. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, one of our fans wants to know. Oh, they want to know. Do you remember your first strikeout of your career? Ooh, first strikeout of my career. Well, it depends. I would say college. Oh. Um, I'll th- like it's hard. Like my like, I'd say college. Not necessarily. I have a favorite strikeout actually. Oh, favorite. Uh, I want to hear that my junior year at Seton Hall we played UConn and I struck Reggie Crawford out on three fastballs up and in Reggie so Crawford. wow yeah so that was that was my pride and joy I love doing that um uh, I wish I had the video that I should probably find it but I got kicked off a of synergy but that was probably my favorite strikeout first one I'll have to get back to that one but if it comes up to me I'll let you know yeah so I'm just curious speaking of uh Reggie Crawford obviously he's a two-way player just like Soya Tani and do you ever think I mean Throughout your career, do you do you ever think of being a two-way player or just you focus on pitching? Oh, I so I played uh at Del Barton. I played third base. Um and that was oof. I loved playing third base. I had I got put there because I had, you know, one of the stronger arms in the team. Now, aside from the fact uh, I graduated in 2017. So Anthony Volpe and Jack Leiter were my teammates. So obviously Volpe oh, wow. was the shortstop position. Yeah. But uh, playing third base uh, had this, you know, second strongest arm or whatever. But it was just funny because the way I throw, it's like all the way down here. So I would actually throw, I'd field the ball and throw it at the first base. So I'm probably would tail back to first base. <laughs> so I really, really, really wanted to play uh, third base and hit in college. But when I got to college, you know, I don't really have the infielder build. And I'm also not fast, but I could field the ball pretty well, make plays. But there were just better options. So I just decided to stick with pitching. Honestly, it's less conditioning for me. I can do my own thing here and there. So, <laughs> yeah. So obviously, take us to your recruitment process in college. Obviously, you didn't. You went to Seen Hall, and uh, you mentioned Princeton, the pitching coach, um, and that had a big influence so far in, uh, in your career. Uh, did how how many offers did you have, and uh, what made you choose Seen Hall? Okay, so believe it or not, I was about seventeen years old when I broke eighty miles an hour. I was a really late bloomer. Um, I had gone, you know, I was pitching, I didn't pitch any varsity innings in my junior year of high school, but, uh, Phil Kandary was the pitching coach at Seton Hall at the time. Uh, he liked my delivery and it was around the time I started working with Joe Hamacher and he kind of saw the potential that could be there. Uh, he sat down with me multiple times and was like, Hey, like, you know, we like the process. We like the delivery. Like he kind of wanted to know what my work ethic was like. Cause he could see that if I got some strength behind me, I could be a, you know, elite college pitcher, which I appreciated. So in terms of like offers, the only real ones that I had were Seton Hall and Villanova. Uh, I had a couple of looks um, from Lafayette. And then by the time I had already verbally committed to Seton Hall, my senior year of high school rose around. I got a little bit older, a little bit stronger. Uh, I'd already committed to Seton Hall and signed the and NLI. Yeah, NLI. And uh, I had like looks like Texas Tech was interested in things like that. But uh, I just chose Seton Hall. I mean, at the time, I wanted to be close to home. Um, I knew the culture there for my dad. Um, it's a really good atmosphere. Uh, what I loved about Seton Hall was, you know, baseball is what you do. It's not who you are. So they were focused on, you know, developing yourself as a baseball player, but also a man. So that's really something important. You got to go with life because, you know, your baseball career is only, you know, this long compared to the rest of your life. So, yeah, I just I chose it. I stuck with it. Uh, Coach Shep gave me plenty of opportunities. You know, I was a reliever my first four years there. 
um, my, my, yeah, first four years, I had a fifth year because of COVID. I went back, said, Hey, I want to start. And he let me start. And I won that role. So I was just comfortable with it. I like taking advantage. I like taking the challenge and I just kind of roll with it. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking of seeing all, you had a great career and, uh, you, you, t- you tied with these appearances, appearances on the team at 15 and you always pitch out a bullpen, did some starting. And what, what, what is that like? Just, to, uh, what, what, how long did it take you to adjust to, to be, a uh, reliever to a starter oh so it's mostly for me it's all about preparation um so obviously like you know you sit down before you're going to winter break you say here here's what i would like to do here's i like to see all this kind of stuff so i just being a reliever it's more so you have to the way i view it is on a seven day scale i like to take one day off you know explore other activities the rest of the six though if you're going to train like a reliever, you have to first wake up and say, how am I feeling today? Am I a six out of 10? Am I a seven out of 10? Am I an eight out of 10? And then from there, I would just train to, you know, build up, like, how can I maintain a seven while getting my work done? Because in season, you know, it's different in college. You only play on the weekends and maybe during the weekdays, but especially, you know, a pro schedule, like the Thunder, you got to be ready pretty much every day versus a starter. You can kind of, you know, pick Tuesdays, hey, a bullpen day, I'm going to, you know, be a three probably from lifting and I got to work my way up to an eight or nine on Friday was when I throw live or when I get my start. And then you kind of reset that process. So it's instead of building up weekly, it's kind of you have to, you know, minimize that high, high and low and, you know, just kind of wake up and how you feel. Some days you do more than others, some days you do less. So it's more so from my standpoint of preparation than the mentality is. You know, you just, it's kind of the same for me. You just get out there, throw strikes, and you know, do the best you can. Yeah. So we have another fan question in in here. We they want to know your some of your best moments as a pitcher so far. Ooh, some of my best moments. So I have two that comes to mind. This is a pretty funny story. So my sophomore year, you mentioned I le- I led the team in uh, appearances at Seton Hall. So I don't know if you know, but I play with a guy Ricky Devito. He's in the Pirates organization right now. He started a game and he went about five innings and then we had another pitcher come in. He didn't do very well, walked the bases loaded and they said, all right, wall this year. And so it's bases loaded, no outs. I'm in the bullpen warming up and everybody's got, and we're up, sorry, we're up like two to one tight game, late game against Xavier, Big East competition at Xavier, by the way, too. So everybody in the dugout's kind of nervous. Everybody in the bullpen's kind of nervous. Like, okay, like what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So I get the ball. They're like, hey, pitch, you're in. I put it down on the mound. I go up to my buddy. His name is Blaze. High five, Blaze. I'm like, you guys want to see what LeBron James game seven looks like? And I ran out on the field. First batter, I swear to God. Strikeout, ground ball, double play, out of it. We kept the lead. We'll come back in the dugout. These kids are like, there's no way you just said that. I was like, absolutely. So that was definitely one of my favorite memories of uh, playing ball. But my second one actually was with the Thunder. Um, we, me and this guy, uh, DJ Wilkinson, Mm -hmm. we were trying to do a little competition. So we would be like, okay, like we were kind of the hardest throwers on the team, not to be that guy, but we had a little competition. So we'd be like, all right, if he gets the eighth, I got the ninth, like, see who can like hit the, you know, hardest of you or whatever. I threw one pitch at 96 and it's dead silent in the stadium on like a Thursday, like eight, like, or, uh, sorry, it was like a Monday, like 1 PM. Through one pitch at 96, you don't hear a peep from the audience and you just hear everyone in the bullpen go, hey, <laughs> it really, it really made me laugh. And that was kind of the joy of it. I was just, I remember being in that moment, be like, wow, like I'm having a lot of fun right now. So there's the two that definitely come to my mind. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the video speaking of DJ Wilkerson, um, Greg Caserta, who, who, uh, who helped us out as a media, as media people with all the interviews and all. And Greg is a great guy, a great person. And obviously he let us do a end of the year, end of the season video with a couple of players and uh, DJ, to say their names, what position they play and best moment. Uh, DJ Wilkinson was in that video, the one, the video we did. I don't know if you saw that video, but we went through like five, six players mentioning uh, their best moments this season. And uh, they came, they, they, uh, they mentioned a lot of great moments. And uh, you guys, uh, even though you guys had an up and down year, you still, you guys still um, had great moments as a teammate. So yeah, for sure. There definitely came a point where, uh, you know, we were obviously trying to win. We were having an up and down season. It's a big shift, too, because the first half, everybody kind of gets dropped for except for three guys and get a whole new set of players. Um, for me, like, even though we kind of struggled towards the end of the season, I, I absolutely love the camaraderie we had. I still keep in touch with, like, Christian Capuana, Nico Leontarakis, DJ, um, Jojo Rodriguez. So all those guys, like, and it's it's cool because in a normal summer ball feature, you get a whole summer to bomb with these guys and you kind of just, you know, dwindle as time goes on. But those guys have been a consistent, you know, stay in touch, that kind of stuff. So 
Yeah, while while you were at Seton Hall, you got to play with your good friend Billy Lane Jr. Uh, I did, so, yeah. yeah. So he actually he shared uh, our post for today's interview on his Instagram. Um, so what was it like being his teammate and playing with him? And um, obviously he was a pitcher too, and uh, and then just to feed off from each other, learning from each other at Seton Hall. Yeah, for him, um, you know, he was older than me. Um, obviously he. Him and I kind of had a similar, you know, arm slot and the just delivery, I guess, maybe a little bit different. But what I really appreciated was him and another guy, Dylan Verdonk, who was a uh, who's from the Netherlands. He those two were the you know upperclassmen that kind of took me under their wing and said, Hey, like, here's how it's done. You know, here's how to be a seat and hall baseball player. Here's how to get, you know, your stuff done. How here's how to get everything, you know, everything you need to do to be ready for that day, or whatever. Like those guys showed me the rope. So I absolutely love being a teammate with them. You know, again, still in touch with those guys. So it was just, I don't know, it was just a good, you know, environment for me. Yeah, so um, we, um, we have another fan question for you. They, wa they want to know about your process after college. Obviously, you went to the MLB Draft League, but um, they want to know if you uh, went through the MLB Draft process and what happened there. So, yeah, if, for a lot of you guys that don't know, there's when you get, uh, you get invited to this, like, portal where teams will send you questionnaires. So I had several years of that. Um, believe it or not, my senior year, uh, when I was in the Northwoods League, I got a call from the Cubs in the ninth round. Uh, they asked me if I would take a ninth round pick for a thousand dollars. Seemed a little bit short, but I was twenty two at the time, so I kind of decided, you know what, like I'll shoot my shot, I'll go back to school. So I kind of passed up on that opportunity, but you know, still trying to knock down some doors. I'm actually, you know, throwing pens, working out, trying to stay in shape. I actually am throwing live to live hitters tomorrow. I have a uh, Max Bird, who's a Double A guy for the Yankees, and I texted Anthony Volpe, but I don't know. I think he's in Europe right now. Okay. But, um, Trying to see, just trying to get work in. And then I have some other uh, guys, a guy, Ed Blankmeyer, who's actually my dad's pitching coach at Seton Hall. Then he went to St. John's and then the Brooklyn Cyclones. But he's helped me get in contact with scouts and, you know, trying to get me in with the Mets organization for spring training. So oh, wow. just trying, yeah, trying to knock down doors and find an opportunity. Um, I've met a ton of people, uh, new and old, that have just kind of helped me out. And I'm really grateful for my family circle. You know, just everybody that's kind of been there for me. So everybody's pulling, you know, all it takes is one. So hopefully, you know, I can get that one opportunity and take advantage. Hey, we're pulling for you also, man. We're family here because we, uh, when we covered you guys, obviously we, I, we interviewed a lot of your teammates and you guys, uh, like I said, great chemistry and great camaraderie, like you said. And uh, speaking of Anthony Volpe, uh, we got to cover him too in person uh, at Somerset. We uh, got to cover a lot of Somerset games before he got called up to triple a and this guy won't be a man he's he's showed out all the time and I'm, I'm hoping he comes to the bronx pretty soon here but um yeah, yeah so speaking of what's it like just to work with other athletes uh, i mean in the same sport but different i mean they're in different areas but what was it like to come together just to work together and get better uh at at, at your craft and obviously he's a hitter but what what do you learn from working with anthony will be what, what's it like for you what's it like to personally like, like that for you uh like personally when i'm trying to you know if i get an opportunity to throw guys who are already in affiliated ball and things like that number one it's feedback for me like where i stand like am i ready you know it kind of it answers those kinds of questions am i ready do i deserve to be in affiliated ball those kinds of things but it also you feed off each other because you kind of you're there to expose each other's weaknesses so you know if i go in there for example tomorrow get lit up on the yeah. fastball but the sliders you know doing well hey i need to work on my fastball so it's it's it, it kind of helps you expose where your weak links are and it's good because it's productive it's like productive criticism without having to say anything so it's mostly you know and the best part is the atmosphere the culture just especially with baseball is just guys are always trying to do better and they might be competing with each other for a job in the big league level and affiliate ball but off the field they're competing with each other to try and push each other uh one thing like i work out uh, this place called the Annex in Chatham with Mickey Bruckner. Um, and shout out to Damien. He's been helping all the minor league guys like Gordon Graceffo's there, a couple other guys as well. And it's not only strength training, but it's, I call it like competitive training because there's a lot of chirping and banter, but it just makes you in this set where it's the mindset where you're like, hey, like I got to get this done or it's over. Like I got to get this done. So for me, it's just a big push. Yeah. So speaking of uh, uh, connections, I saw you were – connected with Greg Weiser on Instagram from the Yankees. And um, he has a similar uh, delivery to you, but um, did, did you ever connect with him in person or meet with him? I have not. No, I would love to though. Yeah. He, he uh, 
I think it's a similar delivery, but this this guy has another great story too from the Yankees, and uh, uh, he he showed what he can do too. And yeah, so speaking of connection, obviously Jojo Rodriguez is with the Mets now, Mets system. And what's a good if you get the opportunity with the Mets? Uh, what's that going to be like to uh, reunite with Jojo Rodriguez? Oh, I would love that. So him and I, you know, we talk, we text and Snapchat a lot. Um, him and I, he will always send me, you know, like I'll send him pictures of me, you know, working out or at the facilities and stuff. He's always like, Hey man, like keep grinding. You'll get here. So it's going to be awesome. He's a good dude. I really enjoy playing and learning from him. Honestly, uh, he's a good person to be around just because he's a good competitor and, you know, someone who can kind of show you what it is to be, you know, I, I especially like with like his demeanor and delivery. He's the kind of guy who goes out there and is just laser focused and, um, I don't know. I'm excited. I want. I would love to absolutely be his teammate again. So hopefully, I get that opportunity too. Yeah, we have another fan question for you. Um, who's the? They want to know who's the funniest teammate that you play with uh, at Trend Thunder. Oh, the funniest teammate. Oh, it's got to be DJ. DJ yeah. or Nico? Nico Leon Tarakis. He he used to go out five. Like Nico would go out, you know, pitch five innings, and he would come back you know, sweat, like almost like steam coming out of his ears. I'm like, that's the firmest 85 you'll ever see east of the Mississippi. Like he loved the banter, loved the trash talk, but had a great time doing it. And uh, he he was just, the he was the funniest. He always had, he always had ways to make us laugh. So wow. him and DJ for sure. When those two were in the bullpen together, it was game over. <laughs> so um, obviously tomorrow is a big day for you too. And what, what, what do you, so for example, uh, how do you prepare? Tell our fans, how do you prepare for when you, Obviously, you don't know when you're going to come into the game, but how do you prepare as if as if you're going to come into the game, and um, and then how are you going to prepare for tomorrow's uh, event? I mean, tomorrow's to thing. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, uh, number one, honestly, is you can do as much you know lifting and throwing as you can, but I would say sleep is a big one. Get to bed early, lots of sleep, lots of hydration, but. You know, that's the physical preparation. Uh, mentally, again, it's just waking up. Like today I woke up, I was feeling like a five or a six. I wanted to do, you know, a laundry list of exercises. But I was like, hey, you know what? Scratch that. I'm going to do extra stretching. I'm going to focus on taking care of my body, that kind of stuff. Um, you're, because I'm not in season and like kind of finding a way to describe this, because you're not in season, you have the luxury to build up. So for example, now on Tuesday, I was throwing a bullpen and then Wednesday, Thursday, I could build into Friday. So it's a little bit different now that I'm trying to throw to live hitters before a season starts. Um, so I'm pretty much doing that, but I want to start, you know, like I said, wake up. How am I feeling? Uh, I do have, you know, weekly requirements. I try to do, you know, for example, plyometric balls or weighted balls three times a week, certain arm care exercises, stretches. But I'd say the biggest thing is sleep for sure. If you can hammer sleep and, you know, just honestly get to bed on time, your performance goes from here to here. Mm -hmm. same thing with journalists like us sports journalists we need sleep <laughs> too because sometimes we're up by up till 3 33 o'clock reporting stuff and uh it's just crazy and it, we're like athletes too which, but uh you guys do it in a different way but uh yeah sleep is really important for uh, athletes and, and 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 for anybody uh who's working long hours and sleep is really important so for you um tell our fans um what did you what were the main things that you learned from trend thunder um and and in the MLB draft league, uh, that got that helped you got to this point for tomorrow. Um, well, two things. Number one, uh, was how to be a professional. I can thank Mick for that. So shout out to him. He really drilled. You know, if you're gonna play at the next level, you know, you can't. You got to act like you've been in the end zone before. It's kind of what he was telling us. You know, you can't be fangirl and you can't be. You know, all about the fame and the autographs and what all. Like you have you have a job to do. You got to get in there. You got to get out. Get ready for the next job. That kind of stuff. And number two, uh, which was a big shout out for Sean Chacon. Mm -hmm. He uh, he helped me kind of mentally prepare a way. You know, if balls are running in on right-handed hitters, he was yeah. like, hey, "Like, why don't you start throwing these pitches away?" And I was like, "I am." He's like, "No, no, no. like throw them like at a left-handed hitter." And I was like, "All right, like I'll try it." Next thing you know, I'm pounding the strike zone, getting a lot more ground out strikeouts. So, I definitely learned that from him, and I was really appreciative of that. But especially in this, it, honestly, I always was taught, uh, for, especially for fastballs, to go in on guys because there's actual velocity and perceived velocity. Like if I throw 99 right by your eyes versus 99 10 feet away, it looks you know two different pitches. So. For him to be, hey, like dominate that outer half and then work your way in, that was really valuable. That's where I really started to find some some success and pick up towards the end of the season. Wow. Yeah, speaking of Sean Chacon, we had the opportunity to interview him before a game in person, before you guys played. And this guy, uh, he brings swag to the team. And does, obviously, yeah. former Yankee, let's go, former Yankee. And he brought swag on the mound, too. 
Uh, you that's this is the type of person you don't want to mess with on the mound. He go, he's a bulldog, and uh, man, what what was it like learning from him, especially coming from being with uh, Mar- uh being in the Yankees bullpen, basically. Um, uh, it was honestly he was the coolest. He came down. He had like you said, he brought swagger. He brought style. Uh, I always loved the shoe game too. Him and Brian had the best shoes. I think Brian loved the Jordans, but um, I don't. It was you know he kind of taught you that you know you love baseball but he kind of what i really liked the most was he kind of reiterated what i learned at seton hall which is something you do not who you are and if you love what you do you'll dedicate more time and effort to it and he was a guy that genuinely loved baseball from every angle whether it was playing it coaching it performing in it whatever it was so for me i think i think just hanging around him and getting to talk to him you know it was very hard not to be like oh man like what was it like playing for the yankees what was it like doing this what was it like doing that instead i found it more valuable asking him, like hey shack like you know my fastball feels weird when i grip it this way like got any stuff for me got any cues for me and he was really on point and nailed ahead and just kind of helped you think he helped you think enough where you could make adjustments in the game but not too much where you were hurting yourself if that makes sense or at least that's how i got you know better did he um since your favorite pitcher is Mariano? Did he tell any tell you any about uh any Mariano stories as teammates? Oh, I wish I never really thought to ask him that, but I have his number. I mean, he does keep in touch with me, so he's been also pulling with me. I uh, sent him some data, so hopefully he can hook me up as well. But uh, next time I get to talk to him on the phone, I'll ask him. Say, hey, Nathan wants to know, and I'll just share it with you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have another fan question for you. Um, they they uh obviously with all the tough situation going on with DeMar Hamlin and obviously now with good news today, we got some good news today for him, a little uh, uh, showing a lot more progress, but they want to know as a base, as a player, have you been in those type of situations that actually we never seen this type of situation before, but they want to know, have you been any in situations of with your teammates or any other players being uh, like collapsed or something? Um. Yeah. I mean, I've played a lot of baseball. Um, you know, always, especially as a pitcher, you're worried about the comeback or to the face. I actually at Seton Hall got one off the leg uh, against Creighton. Um, I mean, yeah, there's there's tons of times, you know, I, I've seen our catcher once uh, we were playing Creighton as well. It was like the second day, actually. Pop fly. We were playing a TD Ameritrade and one of the cameramen there like slipped on the stairs and opened the gate to go on the field while he was catching the ball, like almost blew out his knee. It was a scary, scary situation. But in times like that, you know, what I really appreciate, especially with the NFL community, is, you know, it's not – it's more than the game. It's a person's life. So you kind of, you know, you, you kind of stop everything and make sure they're okay. And also, too, like when they are okay or if they're not okay, like you play for them, you, you're like, hey, man, like we got you. Like do what you need to do. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some scary moments I've had. I've seen, you know, people collide in the outfield, uh, colliding on bunt plays. I've seen, I've seen a lot. But I would just say, you know – it's it's scary. Like at first, you don't know what's going to happen, but you just hope that they're okay. And luckily, the ones that I've witnessed have, you know, all been positive outcomes. But for Demar, I'm, I've been praying for him and his family. It's really tough, a once in a million, you know, injury to happen. But it's also a once in a billion for him yeah. to wake up and still have neurological function and be able to write. So I'm hoping that he continues to get better, and you know, we'll see from there. Yeah, and um, so it's, for tell our fans of. Uh, what are you most looking forward to for tomorrow as you showcase your talent again and show teams that I'm I'm ready and I want to I'm ready to pitch in the majors and the minor leagues and what what's your plan going into tomorrow? What are you most looking forward to, to tomorrow? I'm just excited to, you know, aside from everybody else, I'm excited to prove to myself that, you know, I can hang and that all this hard work, you yeah. know, wake up every day in the off season, you know, like I'm technically a free agent, you could say, like been reaching out to scouts teams you know some giving me feedback some not so it's a lot of eeriness that goes into you know waking up every day working as hard as you can going to bed being like is this all worth it but what I'm most excited about tomorrow is just to be able to prove mostly to myself like hey like I'm doing I'm on the right path and you know this dream that I have this vision of me being able to hang with these guys is very legit and real so I'm really excited to see how that goes well yeah so before we get to the last two things I know you have an event coming up um uh, can you talk about Brian DeGaldo, your bench coach? Obviously, uh, he's big, been a big influence in all of you guys, and now he has another opportunity with the Brewers, which is amazing. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what he can do with them. Um, so can you talk about his uh, growth um, as a coach? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really tough. <laughs> Brian always 
he was another guy actually that made us laugh. Brian and Shaq were, you know, two peas in a pod. Brian is absolutely brilliant. Um, we would always like we'd have Matt Hartshorn bring out the uh, rap soto <laughs> guys would throw bullpens, try to work on stuff. Brian was really good at analyzing the data and being able to put that perspective from a hitter and how you could better yourself. So I'm really excited for him. I think he's gonna do great stuff with the Brewers, but for him, like his presence too, like he's very he's very quiet at first. You have to kind of get to know him, but then when he starts to talk and you get to know him more, like he's a really great dude. He's a really, really, really smart dude. And honestly, I think he was a very underrated asset at, at the Trenton Thunder. So I, I enjoyed my time. I keep in touch with him as well. So excited to see what's going to happen next for him. Yeah. So the last two things here, our team is part of this foundation. It's called the Hugh Jackson Foundation. Um, He's a former NFL coach. He's now coaching at um, Grambling State University. And uh, we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, making sure the community stays safe. And um, and we're working hard to uh, a lot of big human trafficking is big still. And we need to stop that. And now we're trying to help him prevent it. So we'll send you the foundation so you can go check it out. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. And the last thing here, uh, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors and all the essential workers right now? Yeah, I mean. Thanks for everything you guys do. Uh, my 2020 season was unfortunately shut down, but because of you guys, 2021 was able to happen. And, um, you know, it's sad that, you know, the whole world had to shut down due to COVID. But, you know, honestly, it's for me almost, and it's kind of bitter to say this, it was a blessing in disguise in terms of my career because I was able to, you know, take, what was it, five to seven months, go down to Florida with my family, spend a lot of family time, quality family time that I would never really have the rest of my life, be able to work on my craft and still really discover who I am as a pitcher and a person. So I thank you guys for getting, you know, society back to normal semi-ish. And I really appreciate you guys continuing your efforts to keep, keep everyone safe and healthy and just, you know, starting off 2023 with a great, with a great vibe. So. Yeah. Well said. And, uh, to let our fans know where they can find you on social media and where they can follow you and uh and uh and follow your journey too. Yeah, I'm uh, Hunter at H U N. I think it's H U N underscore E R W two six, but uh, that's my Instagram. And then Twitter is just at H Waldis. But yeah, I'm mostly active on Instagram. Probably see a lot of pictures of my girlfriend. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. You good? <laughs> but um, yeah, I I'll always be you know keeping you guys in the loop of my journey. Uh, my favorite quote I heard was from a, a really good friend of mine, uh, Kevin Daney, actually said, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And uh, it really speaks true because as much as I want to, you know, wish I could get the contract of my lifetime right in front of me, the stories and the people I meet and the adventure along the way is, you know, kind of invaluable, so to speak. So I'll have that for the rest of my life and I'll be thankful for it. Yeah, well, shout out to your girlfriend and shout out to your family for being on your side from day one. And hey, I don't mind those pictures because you, it's a memories, all memories, especially being part of family. And um, but there you have it, man. The fans, uh, the fans, uh, a couple of our fans are, are saying that this was awesome, great episode, and uh, they say continued success too. Uh, but thank you for coming on the show and uh, sharing your story to our fans. And like I said, good good luck for tomorrow. We're, we're, we'll be rooting for you. I hope you get the opportunity, man, with the Mets or some other team. But keep up the great work. Uh, we, uh, luckily, we had uh, luckily we had the opportunity to cover you guys in person, and we, I'm looking forward to seeing all you guys' careers now. And um, and thank you again. And hopefully, you get to meet the full our full team here at the NR Hour pretty soon. But uh, just keep up the keep up the great work. Good luck for tomorrow. And guys, please continue send prayers to Demar Hamlin's family, please and friends. Uh, He's he obviously getting better, but slowly progressing here. But uh, Hunter, thank you again, and uh, uh, good luck tomorrow. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Thanks to all the fans out there. I appreciate you guys. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.